If you're joining us today, we're jumping into a series and continuing a series that we started a few weeks ago entitled Gratitude, A Reasonable Response. And uh, if you haven't been a part of the last couple of weeks, let me just tell you where we get this phrase from, a reasonable response. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul is writing to the believers and he's reminding them of all that Jesus has done for them. In fact, he begins in Romans chapter 1 with this Uh, onslaught of sin and how sin entered into humanity and how it began to barrel out of control. And as it did, God sent his son Jesus, gave us freedom through Jesus, gives us a new life. And so in light of all of this, Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, in light of all that Jesus has done for us, he says there in the last part of this verse, it's just our reasonable service. It's just our reasonable response in light of all that God has done for us to yield our lives to him and to worship him and to honor him and to live our lives in a way that's reasonable. And so it's this word in our English word where we get the word logical in English from this word reasonable here. It's just logical. It makes sense that in light of what God has done for us that we would live this way. And how many of you know, in light of all that God's done for us, gratitude is a reasonable response, right? But how many of you also know that over time, sometimes we forget to be grateful? Oh, you can do better than that, (laughs) right? We forget to be grateful. How many of you have ever used this phrase, I'll never forget that? Yep, and then you walked into the other room and you forgot that, (laughs) right? My wife says, hey, write this down. I'm like, I don't need to write this down. I'll, I'll never forget that. Yep, I get the grocery store, I forgot that, right? And some of you have lived there as well, but I digress, we move on. Um, And so as we move through this process, there's just times in life where we never, we say that we'll never forget. I remember uh, September 11th of 2001, and uh, we remember where we were at, many of us, some of us weren't even born yet, and I don't even know how to put that into my mind right now, because I feel like everybody was born prior to that, you know, because we're all so young, and... um, but I'm getting older and uh, not necessarily wiser. I'm trying to, but not necessarily. Uh, but through that process of time, we use this phrase of 9-11 that says, never forget. And life happens, does it not? For a number of years, this, this flag is in my office. This flag was flown over the USS Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And if you have followed history or taken any sort of history lesson, you understand that Pearl Harbor is one of the most historical landmarks of the world. It is literally a part of world history, not just American history, not just Hawaiian history, it's a part of world history. And, uh, you know, sometimes I find myself with this on my desk, not really paying attention and focus to it. And so this morning, even as I was processing, I was reminded of this flag. And I was reminded also of how whenever we had the opportunity to live there, how Daily, I would drive by the USS Arizona, the memorial. And it's a, if you've never been, it's a very moving experience as you step out and you take a boat and you step over and you look over the USS Arizona, which is still there beneath the water surface. And still yet, even though they've pulled all of the diesel and the oil from this many years ago, still yet on a daily and almost hourly Drops of oil, which what they call the tears of the Arizona, will come to the surface as just a way of um, not even by anybody's hand that just continually rises, and it is a reminder continually of the lives that were lost there. But even with all of that and that moving experience and even seeing some of the survivors of that as you would go and visit this, every day I would drive to and from work and I would pass right by this and you know, it, the, when I first moved there, it was like one of these moving experiences where every time you saw it, you just remembered. You know what I'm saying? But then life happened. Didn't life happened to anybody else before? Where you're, you're caught in traffic, and I lose my salvation, sanctification, every other thing, my attitude and all that, and, and I no longer think about the memorial, but now I'm just worried about this car in front of me. And, and so through the process of time, I, I failed to remember. Even though I said I would never forget, 
I failed to remember. And your life and my life is a lot like that because as we move along in life, what sometimes happens to us is we're rushing around with the kids and we're trying to get them to school and to their events and to life. And, and what happens sometimes along the way is that we forget that those were the, that's the wife, the spouse, the husband that we once prayed for that we, never, we did not have. And those irritating things where we're having to travel with the kids and move them around, we once did not have those children, but those children, many of them, are a gift from God that we prayed for. But in the moment, sometimes we forget. Can I get an amen? amen. Sometimes in our singleness, we look at those who are married and we long for what they have and we just wish that we could be married because it just seems like they have it all together. But there are sometimes as married people, don't say amen to this, Sometimes you look back on the singleness and what you begrudged in that moment, what you begroaned in that moment, you look back and you're like, man, God's grace was on me in such a powerful way. And, and some of us are in that place now, and if you were just to look back to just a year ago, there was relationships or people that you really thought was the one that turned out not to be the one, and sometimes you look back and you can give thanks because God spared you. You see, life happens and we forget. And when we forget, it moves away from our hearts away from what God has for us. And so today we're going to look at Psalms 103. And it's one of those moments, I believe, in the life of David when David almost forgot all that God was doing and or had done in his life. You see, God, throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, he gives us what we would call holidays, but in the Jewish life, they were celebrations, they were observances, they were times to stop, to pause, to remember. Whenever you and I celebrate Thanksgiving in a few weeks ago, or a few weeks to come, what we will do is we'll have this pause where it's to come, this time that we reflect on all that God's provided for us. But if we're not careful, we sometimes miss those. And so Paul, I mean, David, I believe, is in one of those moments, and David is having one of these self-talks. Anybody ever talk to yourself? Right? I used to work with a guy. He always said this whenever I walked by and he was always talking to himself. I said, why are you always talking to yourself? And he says, it's the smartest conversation I can find. <laughs> he wasn't wrong. The man went home and read the dictionary before he went to bed. And so I find myself in some of those moments. It's where I begin to speak to myself. I call it my Townsend kid moments. Whenever I use the phrase Townsend Kid, it's my way of directing myself to say, hey, you need to get this together. It's one of those moments kind of in coaching where the coach pulls you over and says, hey, listen, you need to get your head in the game. You need to get your act together. You need to pull it together. That's, I call them my Townsend Kid moments. And so I just say, hey, Townsend Kid, like, you've got to do better on this. Paul, or excuse me, David in this passage in Psalm chapter 103 is kind of in one of those moments where he stops and he's talking to himself. And he uses this phrase. He says, bless the Lord my soul and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. David is saying, listen, this is that moment where my emotions have to take the back burner and I have to intentionally bring to the forefront of my mind what God has done. You see, Tony Evans says it like this. He says, our emotions do not have intelligence. They don't have brains. They only have feelings, and we can be very easily moved by our feelings, but sometimes we have to, with our intellect, speak to our feelings because our feelings are not always right. And so David says, here, listen, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is not about you, David. This is not about how you're feeling or what good is happening in your life or what bad is happening in your life. This is about his name is worthy to be praised. And so David says, let everything, let every fiber of my being bless the Lord. Let it exalt him. Let it extol him because he is worthy. He goes on to the next verse, verse 2, and he says, bless the Lord, my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. Here's what David's saying. Listen, he didn't say, just don't forget his benefits. David said, don't let one of the Lord's good things pass you by. 
don't let one of his many benefits towards you slip past this moment that you don't arrest your mind, your feelings, and your emotions, and you give praise to the one who has given those to you. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits. Today, I want to talk to you for just a few moments about this idea of our benefits, and we're going to use this phrase to kind of set the sermon in a sentence, and it's this. Gratitude is a reasonable response to the benefits of God. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would move in our hearts and our lives with the power of your word, by the power of your spirit, that your spirit would bring the word, the words, the letters, the sentences, the phrases from these pages, and may they have life, and may that life speak into our spirits today. Lord, in these moments where we sometimes forget what has or has not happened, may, Lord Jesus, we be reminded of all the benefits that you have provided to us. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Christ's name we pray, amen. I want to look one more time at this passage, Psalms 103, verse 2. This is in the New Living Translation. He says, let all that I am praise the Lord, and may I never forget the good things he does for me. God's done some amazing things in our lives. Can I get an amen to that? He's spoken, he's provided, he's done some miraculous things for us. He does good things in our lives. You know, I grew up on a dairy farm. I grew up on a family farm. We, in those days, I didn't know anything about retirement funds. We didn't have insurance. We didn't have paid vacations. You know, we just worked. If we did well enough to save some money, we put some money aside, and maybe perhaps we got to go on vacation. If we had a good year, perhaps we could do something fun, or if we had money in the bank, then we could go to the doctors, whatever it may be. And so I just didn't know. So all of my life and my immaturity uh, financially, whenever I got my first opportunity to get a real job, all I looked at was just the bottom line. I just needed to know how much I was going to make per hour. Now, it didn't always have to make sense. It was just one of those things. I just wanted to see how much money I was going to make, right? And so I remember my first job. I I, I didn't look at benefits. Hey, listen, I got paid $5 an hour. And some of you guys haven't seen $5 in a long time. Some of you think that's an amazing amount of money. You wish you made $5 in those days. And then I remember working for $5, and then I had the opportunity to work at a job for $6 an hour. And I was like, hey, that's me. That's a dollar raise. That's a pretty expensive raise, right? I didn't take in and factor into the idea that I had to drive an hour to make that extra dollar. I also didn't figure into that, that platform that whenever I got there, that they didn't pay me overtime because on the farm, they don't have to pay overtime. And so I didn't realize that all of my life was going to change. I was just thinking, listen, I'm making more per hour. But most of us in this room and most of us today, when we're considering new jobs, what we're looking for is not always just the salary amount. We're looking for the benefits, did you know that benefits and jobs are not a new thing? I, th- I keep thinking that benefits are recent, but it's not. You can go all the way back to 13 BC. That's a long time ago. Caesar Augustus said this. He recognized that his soldiers had the opportunity to rebel against them, that the very ones that he trained to fight for him could one day get upset at him and fight against him. And so the way that he thought that he would cre- keep their loyalty was that he would pay them a pension. And so he began in 13 BC to pay for the pension. It's kind of moved forward and into the colonial years. Plymouth saw the same thing whenever they were developing early America. And so whenever the soldiers and those people who are farmers and other parts of life, whenever they were fighting to keep freedom for their area and their region, and they were wounded and battled, early in the colonial era, they began to set up pensions to care for those soldiers and those farmers and those who were fighting in the war. In 1875, American Express became the first private company to provide pensions for its employees. That's a long time ago. You move into the late 1800s and early 1900s when companies began to see that their workers were getting sick and injured on the job, and so they began to develop the early stages of health care. By the time 1910 rolled around, Montgomery Ward was the first company to provide insurance or health care to their employees. Now, you're going to be really upset about the next one. 
In 1910, President Taft said to himself, like, listen, this whole work thing is kind of laborious. I kind of get mundane, and sometimes I just need a break. Can I get an amen? And so as he was developing this, he came up with this beautiful proposal. The proposal was this, that every worker should have two to three months of vacation every year. Come on. Are you listening, Pastor Bo? Are you listening? Hey, listen, I'm just thinking to myself, like, the beginning of November and to about January is a great time to have two to three months off. I mean, let it begin with hunting season, let it end with hunting season, let us say amen. <laughs> Every day, all day, come on, man, that's a, that's a great idea. What wisdom God gave him. But it was turned down. President Taft actually said this. He says, I feel like that the workers will come back more energetic and more enthusiastic about the work. I would. Like, listen, I'd be living for next November. That's what I'm talking about. If I could just get to November, this hunting season coming. I say all that to say sometimes what happens is we look at a dollar amount and we fail to see the many benefits that are provided to us. One of my friends was leading a, a group of employees, and the employees continued to complain about all of the things they were seeing what other people were making in another company, in another organization, and they kept complaining about how their salary, and so he sat down and he created an entire list of all of the benefits that they were provided that was not a part of their package. Listen, you have a company card that you get to take employees out on. Did you realize that when you take that many employees out every year, that that's about... $1,500 to $2,000 that you get extra because that's meals, your meals that are being paid for by the company. And they're like, no, I didn't think about that. Well, think about it because that is a benefit that you're providing, right? And so when we begin to look at this, what happens is in your life and in my life, we all fall into the trap where we begin to look at other people in comparison. And when we do, we're looking at their salary and we're not considering our benefits, and you and I sometimes can look at other people. We can look at their houses. We can look at their cars. We can look at their jobs, their families. And we can begin to compare ourselves. And if we're not careful, we begin to bemoan what God's given us. And we fail to be grateful for what God has blessed us with because we're failing to consider all of his many benefits that he has provided to us. The psalmist says in Psalm 73, one day he's sitting there and he's looking at the people around about him and he's looking what's happening in their lives and he begins to get upset because it seems that the wicked are prospering. It seems like the ones who aren't trying to live right and to do what's right, they continue to be blessed and yet here he is, he's trying to do the things that honor Jesus, the things that honor God, and yet he's not walking in the same blessing. So he gets into the presence of the Lord. The scripture says in Psalm 73 verse 1, God certainly is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart but he says as for me my feet came close to stumbling my steps had almost slipped verse 3 he says for I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked you know what happened is in this moment he failed to be grateful for the benefits that God had provided for him he forgot that he was never going to forget what God did but he forgot and he says, I struggled with this. And you go down to verse 16 and 17, and he says this. And he says, when I thought of understanding this, it was troublesome in my sight. In verse 17, until. Everyone say, until. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I perceived therein. He said, listen, sometimes you just have to get into the presence of God to see what his benefits are, to be reminded of the intangibles that come with serving him and having him as your God. Sometimes it's not always in the bigger house or the perfect family or the perfect job or the perfect car. Sometimes it moves beyond those things into supernatural and, and things beneath the surface that God's providing for us that you and I, if we're not careful, we fail to give God thanks for. So gratitude is a reasonable response to the benefits of God. And David lists here in this passage, he lists five things that come with our relationship that God provides for us. Number one, in verse three, he says that God forgives. He, God moves, he pardons all of our guilt. Go ahead to that verse, please. He says, he is the one who pardons all your guilt. Now, I want you to think about this. This is David. We remember David. 
David was a little shepherd boy. David was the one who defeated Goliath. David is the one who was the unlikely candidate to become king, but he became king. And while he became king, guess what happened? He wasn't satisfied with all that God had provided for him, and so he longed after, lusted after another man's wife. And so while that man was in battle, he brought her wife, his wife near, and she became pregnant. He said, oh, no, i got to fix this. And so when he tried to fix this, he brought her husband from the battle line, and whenever that didn't work, he sent the husband back to the front of the war, and he told all of his people to back up and let him stand alone so that he would be killed on the front line of war. Can you imagine with me for just one moment that every night when David went to bed, that the memory and the shame and the regret and the embarrassment of who he was came rolling over his mind. You see, you can change a lot of things in your life. You can change your bank account. You can change your house. You can move all around the country. You can do whatever you want to do. But guess what happens? The memories of your failures and my failures, they continue to replay over and over in our minds. And David said, one of the benefits that I fail to remember is that, God, you are the one who pardons me of all of my guilt. Not some of my guilt, not just a few things, but all of those things that keep me up at night, my failures, my brokenness, my, my, my sins. You, oh God, you pardon all of my sins. Can I just say to you, if you're in this room, some of us, who have surrendered our life to Jesus Christ and we felt this overwhelming release of grace and forgiveness from him, you and I can sometimes forget what we felt like before Jesus washed us clean. Go back and allow yourself to relive the memories of when you cried yourself to sleep, unable to break those thoughts. Think of the shame of the things that you've done, that I've done, that you cannot undo. And then give God praise for the forgiveness and the pardon and the release of that guilt that's over your life and over mine. David says the second thing I give thanks for is I give thanks for God's healing. He says, who pardons all your guilt and who, say this with me, heals all your diseases. Now listen, this is a complicated phrase coming from David's lips. We believe in the power of healing. We believe that God heals. We believe that God does miraculous things. But some of us in this room, some of us watching online, some of us are dealing right now with medical issues that we haven't been able to find the cure for. We have loved ones who have lost their fight against cancer. We have those who are near to our hearts. And so for David to say, listen, you heal all of our diseases is a very complicated statement. And can I tell you really quickly that if you're one of those that's sitting in that place where God hasn't done it yet, where God hasn't provided the healing, where he's not provided the miracle, David sat in the same seat that you're sitting in. Because David was sitting there as he's penning these words, David himself is remembering in his own life how his own child died and God did not heal him. And so was David just saying that God has this wide broad, uh, bro brush stroke that he just he does everything? Or was David saying, listen, God makes all things right. God has a way that, Lord, you heal things both physically and internally and spiritually and emotionally in ways. Because sometimes we look at this and we think, oh, this is only in the natural can I just have you go back in your mind like I have to go back in my mind and look at the dysfunction and the brokenness of my family and the things that I came out of and my own decisions and choices. And some of those things I can hardly remember because over time God has graciously healed those wounds and those memories. And so it's not always just about the physical, but here's the beautiful thing about it. What we know is that one day all things will be made right. The scripture says that in heaven there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there are no tears, there are no sickness. So we recognize that in time God's going to do all and he's going to heal every disease and sickness. But while we may not be there right now, let me just say this real quickly. Have you stopped to give God thanks for the healing that he has provided in your life? You know, I can go back, and just a few weeks ago, I was on some antibiotics, and, um, and so I was sitting there one day processing, and I just, I don't always do this, I wish I was more spiritual like this, but this particular day, I just had to think and say, you know what, there was a day in time 
where this antibiotic wasn't available. And people died from the infections that we just go get medicine for today. Hey, listen, some of us are old enough, we've played Oregon Trail enough to know that you, people die. I, I don't know about you, so I'm speaking to a generation. All right, some of us lost entire families with dysentery on the way to find freedom. You know what I'm saying? I haven't even heard of someone ever in life who had dysentery, but like somebody in that game, those people die with dysentery all the time. But like, listen, I say that jokingly, but seriously, because some of the things that killed previous generations, we no longer deal with. And sometimes we forget. I believe, you can say it's science or medicine or whatever, I believe that God gives people wisdom and he gives doctors and technology. I believe that God uses that to help us through. And so listen... It may not be in every area of your life, but is there a place in your life that you can look back and see God's faithfulness and his healing? If so, it's reasonable to say, God, thank you. Spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, you've healed my body. The third one is this, that God redeems. God's redemption. The psalmist said in Psalms 103, verse 4, he says this, who redeems your life from the pit. How many of you just remember where God brought you from? I mean, listen, my life was broken. Maybe God just did a few things in your life, but my life was horribly broken. I was in a pit. I was bound, and I was going to a place of destruction. But God, in his mercy and in his grace, redeemed me. He bought me back from the pit of death. He brought me back. The psalmist says in Psalms 40, verse 1, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he reached down to me, and he heard my cry. Verse 2, he brought me up out of the pit of destruction and out of the mud, and he set my feet on a rock, making my footsteps firm, and he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. Hey, listen, one of the things we have to just go back to is just remember that God is the one who redeemed us from the pits. It's a pit of destruction that he saved us from. The fourth thing is this. God grants us favor. Now, the psalmist says it in verse 4, the last part of this. He says here, who crowns you with favor and compassion. Some other versions will say, who is the one who grants you loving kindness and mercies. This word is the Hebrew word hesed, which means that God has done something so much farther and beyond what you and I even deserve. I love Michael Card. He defines it like this. He says, has said, this word loving kindness or favor is when the person for whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. Can I tell you, if I could just go back in my life, there's no way possible that I could have created the path line to where I am today. The relationships, the connections, the people, the jobs, the opportunities, the people that God brought into my life that helped direct me even into how I, uh, in my marriage and how I direct my marriage and live out uh, my, my life as a husband. There was a lot of things that were rewriting my path and it was because God in his favor and his loving kindness and his mercy went before me and gave me things I had no possible idea that I would ever need. God's favor and loving kindness is upon you. And it may not seem like it right now, but trust the process because he who began a good work in you will bring it forth into completion. So just hang on if you're in that season because his favor is upon you. Finally, David says in verse five, he says that God grants us satisfaction. He satisfies our soul. He satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The eagle in scripture is often reminded of and, and is used as a theme to say that the older it gets, it never loses its youthfulness. You know, some things as they age, they begin to lose their strength, they begin to lose their dignity, they begin to lose their power, but the eagle in scripture is one of the ones that remains and it's used as the sign of saying that it just remains. And I just think about our lives, and I think about the song my grandmother used to sing. She, said, she would say it like this, and I'm not going to sing it for you, so don't worry. It gets sweeter as the days go by. 
he gets sweeter. It doesn't become sour, it doesn't become bitter, it doesn't become toxic. He just gets better and better and better the longer that I serve him. Is not God good to us? David would say to himself, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. This is not about your feelings. This is not about your bank account. This is not about that job. This is about a sovereign God who's at work from beginning to end, who has written your name in the palm of his hand, who knows your beginning from your end, who knows what's good for you and what's harmful for you, who is directing your path, and that even in the moments where it's rocky and it's painful, that he's still yet moving. You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again because I'm always reminded of it in moments like this. There is a song that the Jewish people sing in Passover. And it's called Dainu. And what it literally means is, it would have been enough. There's 15 stanzas in this song, and they go all the way back to the beginning. It's three different sections of five verses. And as they start it out, they begin it with this. If you had only delivered us from the slavery of Egypt, it would have been enough. Meaning, that was a reasonable enough response for us that we would worship you for the remainder of our lives because you were that good to us. But they didn't stop there because God didn't stop there. They go on to the next line. It says, if you had only given us victory over our enemies, Dainu, that would have been enough. But God didn't stop there. And God's not stopped in your life, and he's not stopped in my life. He didn't just save you from your sins. He's loaded down your life with his benefits. He's taken away your guilt. He's healed you in your body, emotionally, spiritually, physically. He's mentally, he's healed you. He's redeemed you from the pit of destruction. He's ripped you out of some destructive situations and relationships in your life. He's granted you with his favor, his loving kindness. He's done things for you that you could have never put together. And he just keeps getting better and better and better because he satisfies you every day with that which you have need of. He is worthy to be praised and gratitude is a reasonable response to all of God's benefits. Would you stand with me? I want to say I recognize and acknowledge that some of us in this place, some of us at Lindale, some of us watching online, or maybe you're watching this, and maybe, maybe it's hard for you to see what God's doing right now. Maybe you're in the midst of that divorce. Maybe your son or daughter is away from God, and maybe the job's not working out very well. Maybe finances are tight, and maybe it's hard to see. But God's benefits are still evident in your life. And so part of the moment is to not let your emotions take control of your faith, but to pause and speak to your emotions and remind them of how good God has been to you. Because there's something. For others of us in both campuses and watching online, for others of us, this is a matter of like maybe you stepped in here today and you don't know what it's like to have the peace of God reign in your heart and in your life. 
And maybe where you are in your life and the sins that are controlling you and the things that you've done and the relationships that you've been in and where you are at this phase and stage of life, maybe you are the one that's crying yourself to sleep every night. And maybe your bank account is filled. Maybe you have the best cars, the best house, and everything in the business world and success in the eyes of the world is perfect in your life. But you can't get past the failures. You can't get past the things that you've done. Can I tell you about my friend Jesus? The woman at the well said, come, let me show you a man who told me everything I've ever done. But his mercy and his grace was so compelling that the whole town went to see him because he was the only one who could give them what money could not buy, what no relationship could provide. He was the one who could provide freedom for them. And today, if that's you and you're saying, I just need that freedom. There's no doctor, there's no medicine, there's no job, there's no house, there's no car, there's no relationship that can give you that. It's Jesus. Every head bowed and every eye closed, both campuses. If you would say, Alan, that last part that you talked about, that brokenness and needing something and forgiveness, that's me. And you're willing to say, Jesus, here's my life. I need you to come be Lord of my life, to wash me and to cleanse me, to free me from myself. If that's you, I want to ask you to raise your hand right where you are. I want to pray with you. Amen. 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 Our Lindell campus will be joined together. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would minister to our hearts and to our lives. God, those hands that went up across this room, Lord, we give you thanks for your faithfulness, Lord. We give you thanks for forgiveness. You give us what money cannot provide and that you bring freedom. You free us from all of our guilt. You cleanse us from all of our sin and our shame. And you grant us new life. That's a benefit that money cannot provide. So Lord, today with those hands that went up across this room, God, they're just needing freedom from their past. They're needing freedom, freedom from themselves. The scripture says that we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The scripture says that if we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you will come wash and you will uh, cleanse us from our sins and you will take ownership of our hearts. And so, Lord, today I ask that you would perform that miracle in the lives of those hands that went up across this room at our Lindell campus and those who are joining online. Would you bring about true transformation today? God, would you meet the others who are in the room who are walking through some difficult moments and they can't see your goodness. May you give them scriptures and reminders that they may speak to their emotions and remind themselves of the benefits that you've provided for them. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. Can we close with this? Love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, one for another. Even so, come Lord Jesus. God bless you. Have a great weekend.